Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar brought to you by CodeFresh Live. Uh, today, we're going to show you the brand new and actually the world's first ever live CI CD debugger. Um, my name is Taryn Jones, and I'll be your moderator today. But our presenter is Dan Garfield, Chief Technology Evangelist for CodeFresh. And he's going to show you how the de debugger works in real life scenarios and, and in turn, how you can cut down on the time you spend in your pipelines and what a truly modern approach to CI CD looks like. Um, we will be taking your questions throughout the session. Just please remember to submit them in the Q using the Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar rather than in the chat, and we can keep better track of them that way, and then we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, this session is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of it, don't worry. It will be sent to you uh, by the end of the week. Lastly, please remember to reference codefresh.io slash events for our upcoming webinars as we have fresh and informative webinars for you several times a month. Uh, so that's it for the housekeeping items. And with that, I will hand it over to Dan to start the presentation. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much, Taryn. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, this is actually, I think, one of the more exciting things that I get to do because this feature around live debugging is one of the coolest things I've seen. So anyway, let's jump into it. Um, to introduce myself really quick, my name is Dan Garfield. I'm the Chief Technology Evangelist for CodeFresh. Most of you probably already know that. Um, I'm also a Google Cloud developer expert, uh, as well as, well, it's actually a Google developer expert focused on cloud. Um, and uh, I'm also a member of the Forbes Technology Council. So uh, those are my bona fides. I've been working in engineering and, and DevOps and Kubernetes for a long time now. Um, so I'm gonna jump straight into uh, the, the debugging here after a quick intro. For those of you that don't know what CodeFresh is, uh, we're a CI CD solution built on top of containers, built on top of Kubernetes, and we're really um, focused on cloud native applications and how you build, test, and deploy those. So uh, that's that's our focus, and we have a lot of tooling that's specific around that. Of course, people do run classic workloads. They deploy VMs using CodeFresh. That's just fine. We've got great tooling for that, but our focus is on the cloud native tool set. Um, we even have people building Android apps and, and things like that. We have you know, Windows support, Mac OS support. Um, so uh, a lot of fun stuff going on there. So let's get into it. Uh, pipelines break. And they break uh, sometimes ambiguously and sometimes spectacularly. Uh, and not only that, but when you're building a pipeline, uh, it can be a very tedious process because the only way to get information about it is you read the logs and then you tweak your pipeline and you rerun it again. Um, and really what happens a lot of times is you change your pipeline, you save it, you commit it, you push it, then you rerun it, wait a while for that thing to actually execute. And so anybody that builds pipelines or maintains pipelines develops a few tricks around this. Um, I uh, like to you know, comment out a lot of steps so I can focus on the stuff that I'm working on. Um, but this is a time consuming and fairly tedious process. But uh, we have found a better way to do this. Um, now in the past, uh, people have used something like SSH to just go on to wherever the build node was to actually work with the platform there. But this is really a only, uh, well, there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of problems with this approach. Uh, for one thing, it really relies on VM-based pipelines, um, which are problematic anyway. Uh, they tend to be slower. They tend to, um, you know, you don't get a lot of the caching and performance advantages of something like CodeFresh when you use a VM-based solution. But also, just letting someone SSH onto a build node, the only thing they can really do is examine the tooling that's there. They can't actually get the running context of the pipeline. Um, they can't see what the state is. They can't see what the environmental variables were. Um, all they can really do is go into an environment where the tools are installed and, and mess around. Uh, so this is not very helpful. And it's also a big security problem. Um, it's fairly common for people to give SSH access to their build nodes to engineers. And this actually exposes you to risk, right? Because um, someone SSHs onto a build node, you don't know what they're doing and they could slip in things that could affect pipeline executions 
and potentially cause um, cause uh, you know code execution that you don't want happening. So this isn't very secure either, and it's also not very helpful. Also, those SSH logs usually um, they're usually not auditable. There's usually very poor permission sets around it. So uh, it tends to be a pretty kludgy solution that doesn't actually help with building and testing pipelines that much. Um, so that's not, that's not a great solution. Now, the whole goal of DevOps, right, is we want to bring developers and operations together. And developers have had debugging code figured out for a long time, right? I mean, we've got this <laughs> the ability to add breakpoints to code in an IDE is something that is probably, I think it's probably existed for 30 years now. I mean, this is an old idea. Um, and when you add breakpoints to code, it gives you the ability to view variables, calls, you can resume, you can step forward, you can pause things, you can interact with your application in real time and figure out what's really going on. Um, and this is great because it gives you the exact running state. It gives you, uh, it gives you all of this insight. And um, without this, you basically end up having to echo out or print out uh, a bunch of information on every uh, ex pipeline or every application run that you do. And, and uh, I, <laughs> I, I, it's embarrassing, I know, but I will admit that I, I got my start writing a lot of PHP and I ended up having, uh, having, a lot of <laughs> having a lot of echoes in my code so that I could see what was going on to try to, to, try to debug it. So um, as embarrassing that is, uh, well, developers figured out breakpoints a long time ago, but operators, people, DevOps, people that work on pipelines, they want that same ability. They also want that same breakpoint technology, <laughs> if you will. So uh, this is actually what we've added in CodeFresh. You can actually run a pipeline in debug mode, and then you can set breakpoints at any point along that pipeline, both before, during, or after a pipeline execution to interactively uh, engage with your pipeline. Um, and here you can see, this is uh, just a quick screenshot where you can see that uh, this has actually started a debug console. So when you run in debug mode, you're going to get an interactive console where you can actually uh, manipulate and work with uh, the pipeline. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick, simple demo, and we're going to build on that and do get into some more complex and more interesting scenarios. So let me clear my screen here. Let me bring this over. There we go. All right. So uh, I've got this simple pipeline called simple debugging. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and you can see all of these steps are just Alpine. That's all that's going on here. Um, so I'm just going to run this uh, in debug mode. And this is going to allow me to add in breakpoints wherever I want. Um, so you can see I, I've actually done this before. So I have these breakpoints set to override at these different steps here. Um, these are overrides. Uh, you can also set breakpoints before and after. Um, one of the reasons that uh, before and after are so useful is when you're using a type step. So if you're using like a Docker build step, you can't actually do an override on that step. You can only do a before and after on that step. Um, if you're doing a freestyle step, then you can actually override the step. So this is, uh, this is now starting. We can see that the, it's kicking off the, the debugger. Now, uh, one, one thing about this, this is a brand new feature we just announced. And I think that there's uh, more optimizations that we're gonna be doing onto it. I noticed that right now it runs a lot faster when you're using Alpine-based images than Debian-based images. Debian-based images need a lot more tooling installed. Uh, so here, now you can see I've actually dropped into a debug console. Now. If you don't understand how a CodeFresh pipeline works, this, this whole flow might actually be confusing. So it's worth taking just a second to talk about it. Um, if you look here, let me shrink that a little bit. If you look at this pipeline, what you see is uh, a bunch of steps. And some of these are staged out. Every single one of these steps actually is running in its own container. And every single step is attached to a shared volume. So this is a container-based pipeline. This allows me to use Docker images or steps, essentially like functions that I can call in my pipeline. 
and we have this whole huge library of steps that you can use um, for doing things like canary releases, blue green deployments, getting vault secrets, de deploying to Helm, setting up pull requests, Slack alerts, whatever. We have this huge library of these things. And you can literally use any Docker image um, to, uh, to, uh, as a step as well. So here you can see I'm actually working in this volume. I've exported this out and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create, um, let's just make a directory. We'll call it, uh, we'll call it step one. So now you can see this is in the code fresh volume. So this step one directory is gonna be consistent throughout the entire rest of my pipeline because I've created it in the shared volume. Um, the other thing I can do is I can actually view variables that are being set to export. So I'm gonna run a cat on environmental variables to export. You can see that I don't have anything right now. If I ran a CF export, this is a default command that's always available in, a CS, in the CodeFresh pipeline. Uh, if I run a CF export, uh, foo equals bar, uh, and then we rerun that again, we'll see that, that that variable is now set. And if we uh, if we did like a uh, like a print end on here, um, you're gonna see all the different uh, variables. Oops, my API code key showed up, so I'm gonna have to go disable this after that. <laughs> um, you can see all of the variables that are available when you're running in pipeline execution mode. Hopefully nobody's fast enough to get that. I'll, I'll go reset it after this, um, but it's just a demo, demo account anyway, so it's okay. Uh, all right, so um, I'm going to, uh, let's do a, uh, let's just go ahead and continue this and we'll see that that stuff is available in our next step here. So this is now continuing. We're now moving on and in step two, I have a set before and override. Um, if we look at the, so now we're actually before, we're, we're outside of a container, right? Well, technically no, we're, you're always gonna be in a container when you're in the debug, um, but we're, we're, we're basically not in the step right now. So if I run a, um, a cat on this OS release, you can see that the before override step actually gives you uh, essentially an Alpine image where you can work. Um, and if we cat out, uh, well, actually I can just echo it out. If I echo my, I call it foo, right? Yeah, you can see that that variable is still set because I exported it, even though I'm actually in a different step, I'm in a different container. So this is a very simple kind of introduction to debug pipeline. Let's get into some more interesting scenarios. So I'm gonna stop there. Dan, I have a question really quick in the chat. Um, Andrew just asked, it says that he doesn't understand the word override when it comes to a breakpoint. What exactly is being overridden? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so let me, th that's perfect. All right, that's, I'll show you in uh, this next step. So let me, let me show you what that means. Um, let's go look at a pipeline and we'll look at the We'll look at, uh, actually I'll show you. Okay, I'm gonna show you this one. So see this pipeline, you can see there's a step here. It's only a one step pipeline and it has commands that are set to run. So when you set an override, what will happen is instead of running these commands, it's gonna drop us into the debug console inside this container. Um, and that's actually the next thing I wanna show you. So. I wanna show you what it looks like when you move in and out of containers. And I think this will actually help explain what override means. So uh, let's go to that. Um, you can see I have this pipeline where I basically have steps that are using uh, Go. I have steps that are using Java. I have steps that are using .NET. So I'm gonna run this in debug mode and I'm gonna set um, before and overrides on these, which is gonna allow you to see exactly what happens when you so I'm going to set a before and an override on this Golang. And I'm going to set another one on Java. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to set them all into parallel. Let's just set these all on override. And what we're going to do here is we're actually going to move in and out of containers. And I'll show you some cool stuff. All right, so I'm going to hit continue. And this will go ahead and kick me off. 
All right, so when I execute before, it's actually executing before the step has started, which means that it's actually going to give me a debug console outside of the step, right? So for example, go, you can see is not installed. So it's not available right now. Uh, if I hit continue, it's gonna move me into the override and you can see in this step, all of this step is doing is just echoing a hello world. So we're gonna override that and, re and replace it with my own content essentially. So I'm gonna hit continue and this is actually going to start up the container. You can see the container starting up and the relevant tools for the debugger being installed. And uh, this will allow me to now move inside of the container where I have access to that container tooling. So in this case, I, I can basically run go, <clears throat> that kind of thing. All right, so now if I run the go command, you can see that I actually have it available because I'm now executing inside of that step. And if I cat out the, um, the OS release, you can see that we still are on Alpine, but it's because this step is the Golang Alpine image. So I now have all the things that I need available to me to work on uh, Go. So I'm gonna hit continue. This is gonna run a Java step and a .NET step. And I wanna show you what happens when we actually run steps in parallel. So we have the same three steps, but instead they're gonna be running in parallel. So we're gonna move forward in our, our pipeline. And this is gonna do those simple hello worlds. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you understand now what a, an override does. Um, and I'm going to show you another kind of interesting scenario here. So, oh, you know what? I should have. Well, so in the in the normal uh, in the normal before or after a step, the tools in these steps aren't available. So, like Java's not available, Go's not available, .NET's not available. So, what I'm going to do? I'm going to add afters on these as well. So you can see the before and after. And uh, these are gonna start up three debugger consoles at once, one for Golang, one for Java, and one for .NET. And again, these steps could be doing anything. Um, these, are, these are arbitrary steps, right? So these could be steps that are doing my, um, running my CI tests. These could be steps that are running integration tests. These could be steps that are, that are uh, gathering keys. These could be steps that are pushing um, alerts to Slack. Whatever it is, um, I can actually access them here. So here now I'm in the GoLang. You can see I'm in the override right now. So if I run Go, that's gonna work, right? Uh, let's see Java now. Now, if I'm, in, if I'm in the GoLang one, hang on, let's try to run Java, what happens? Nothing, it's not, it's not found. What about .NET? Also not found. So let's go over to Java and if I do Go, not found, Java, now that's found, right? And .NET, not gonna be available, right? But if I go into my .NET step and my debugger, I'm now gonna have .NET available and Go will not be available and Java won't be available. But remember, I can actually interact with the shared volume in real time. So I'm gonna do a uh, .NET rules over here. And if I go and look over in Java, and I actually check my volume, uh, you can actually see that that .NET rules is now available. And so now if I do another one, like uh, in this case, let's I guess do Java rules. Um, now you can see while I'm in the Java container, I can still see that. But if I go over to my Go container, I can also see both of those rules now available. So uh, you can see how we're all interacting with the shared volume. Now, what would happen if we were devious? <laughs> what would happen if we were essentially uh, dumping uh, uh, gigabytes of data from one step? Um, what would happen to the other step? So let's, let's actually look at that scenario. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, this is a, this is a yeah, dangerous command. Um, I'm gonna cat out dev zero, and I'm gonna pipe this into, uh, oh no, what have I done, dot text. All right, so uh, <laughs> when, I, when we were playing around with this, I showed this to a colleague and he said, this is a dangerous command. Yeah, it's definitely a dangerous command. 
So what's going to happen? Um, can I actually go and engage with that? Well, if I go over to my Java here, you'll notice that I can still engage. And um, what's going to happen, even if I tried to cat out this, oh no, what have I done text, which you can see it's running right now. And, and actually, we, let's just verify that it's running. Uh, sometimes this will actually cause a little bit of a lock. Um, so now my console may not respond on this one because it's actually taking up all of the resources. So I basically spam myself out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this process and we can do an LSIH and uh, you can see that my, oh no, what have I done? Just dumped 11 gigs of zeros. <laughs> so, so now you can see some of these different scenarios of, of what would happen. All right, so we're all back to, we're all back squared away. <laughs> now, um, it will eventually just run out of space and you'll have to delete it in order to, to do anything. But my, my consoles and terminals, you can see now, uh, this was kind of locked because of the CPU was basically pegged reading out zeros. So it, it caught up once that was completed. So, so you see different, different scenarios of how these containers are interacting, even though they're, they're essentially gonna be running off of uh, uh, the same, uh, same resources. Um, now, of course, if I, if I were to continue and go afterwards on this Go image, that Go would no longer be available, right? So uh, you can see kind of how we're moving in and out of containers, accessing different tools, moving out of the container, uh, getting different tools there. Um, we're using that shared workspace. That persists through the entire, through the, uh, through the ent entire container run. Um, normally, when you run a CodeFresh pipeline, that volume is actually preserved and kept persistent and distributed as, uh, as one of about 50 different speed optimization things that we do. But in debug mode, um, that volume is actually not going to be persistent and uh, carried into normal pipeline execution. We wouldn't want it to because we're doing whatever kind of funky stuff here, right? So uh, we're happy with this. We, we, you got to see what it looks like when we run three in parallel. You can see us moving between these different debuggers. Um, so let's get into another scenario. So I'm gonna kill that. And let's talk about dynamic tooling. So one of the things when I'm building a pipeline is sometimes I don't know which tool I need to run every different component. And so I may try a command and find out that it doesn't work. Um, and I'm wondering what's going on. So I look at the logs and maybe I, I can modify my pipeline. But here, because I can run in debug mode, I can actually sort of build my pipeline dynamically by trying different things as I go. So let's look at a scenario where we actually install some tooling uh, and we'll have these tools on demand here. So let's go over to another pipeline. Let me check that out. Keep those questions coming, by the way, I love that. Um, these are a lot more fun to do when we have some interactivity. Let's see, sometimes when I'm running Zoom and 500 things, my computer just runs slow. There we go. All right, debug examples. <clears throat> and let's go over to dynamic tooling. Now here you can see there's uh, an Alpine, uh, a, a lot of these demos I'm showing you very simple pipelines. They're not using our custom steps or anything. Um, most of you have probably seen that already. Uh, so here, this is an Alpine image and it, it updates and installs open excuse me, open SSH. So I'm gonna run this in debug mode as well. And we're gonna see how the, uh, how the tooling actually moves and persists. So I'm gonna go before, override, and after. And let's see how this, how this works. And we're actually gonna install some tooling dynamically. So when you run the override, none of the commands in the step that are specified run. Right, so instead of running it, it just dumps us into the debugger where we can uh, execute things. All right, so I'm in my pipeline. And uh, if I try to do like an SSH, that's not gonna work because I don't have open SSH installed. Okay, so if I do an APK update and, and open SSH, um, this will install it really quick and now I can actually run SSH, right? Okay, but I'm in the before step. Again, if I cat out my OS release, you can see that we're running on Alpine 3.7. I guess I should have set a different specified version of Alpine 
for, for my uh, container step. So I'm gonna move into the step now. And when we look at the YAML, we can see that this is running the Alpine image and that it would normally do this stuff, but it actually hasn't done this because we're overriding it. Um, so in this case, when I run SSH, it's not going to be available. I just installed it, right? I installed it before the step, which is actually not in this container. It's actually not in the step. So I actually have to do it again. And you can see that we overrode the step because this stuff hasn't been installed. So I can, I can uh, do that as well. And, oh. Here we go. Install it really fast. Now SSH is available. And then we also set a breakpoint afterwards. So let's continue. See what happens. Now in this case, is SSH available? No, because now we're actually moved back into the shared workspace. Now in the shared workspace, it's not a single container that's being reused before and after every, every step. Instead, they're all their own instances. So they're all going to be clean and separate, but they all have the shared one, right? Uh, so this, uh, this, this shows you how you can install dynamic tooling, um, try different things out and, and, and build on your pipeline uh, from here. And, and I actually like to jump into this mode run lots of commands and then go and add those things into my pipeline as I go. And that way I basically figure out uh, exactly what will and won't work with my pipeline. I can check state, I can set state and all those kinds of things. And I know what's going to happen. So let's look at a different scenario and I'm going to show you running services. So this is another cool feature in CodeFresh pipelines where you can actually run uh, services either as part of a step or persistently across an application, uh, across the pipeline. So here you can see that I have a services argument before my pipeline even begins that sets up a Redis instance. And this composition syntax, this is basically just Docker Compose. In fact, you can pass a Docker Compose YAML into these steps. Um, so you can see that in our documentation, just Google uh, CodeFresh services. Um, so here you can see a Redis instance that's going to be running for the entire pipeline. So uh, now this pipeline is just a demo of that. So you can see that it, it again, we're using Alpine, I guess. I should have, uh, I should have just set it to use the regular Redis image, um, but, uh, but I didn't. So um, this, this just will install Redis and then it will write. And then later on, three steps, two steps later, it will actually read that out. So let's run this in debug mode and we can show you what it looks like in real time to try to do something like that. And uh, here you can see I've run this before. So it already it remembers where my breakpoints were. So I've set them for override. And here I've also set for override. <clears throat> um, actually, let me show you before really quick because my service won't be available before the container starts. So I'll show you what that looks like. Um, in this initialization, you can see that the services are actually starting. Oh, it caught my, caught my debug. So you can see that the services are actually running here. So we can see what their output is. Let's, uh, let's get into the before step here. And if we remember our YAML here, uh, it's supposed to install Redis and then run this Redis CLI command. Now this, this name, my Redis DB host, this is actually the name of the service that was specified uh, in, the, in the services YAML at the beginning. Um, so actually I should, I should go back and show you that really quick. So let me, let me then show you that. So here, oh, should have taken the other pipeline. You can see in the composition, we have the service name here, my Redis DB host, and then that is the reference URL that we use that's exposed within the pipeline. So I'm going to run this, uh, uh, this command here, but uh, I remember we're right now in debug mode. We're running in the before. Okay. So here the service actually won't be available. So if I do an APK update and APK now if I try, oh wait, 
I did the wrong one. What did I say it was? Add Redis. Oh, I should just run it this way anyway. Kind of learn it, learn a better syntax. Okay, add Redis. So this will install. There we go. Everything looks hunky dory. And now I'm going to try to run my Redis CLI, but this won't work because the service isn't available before the step runs. So they can't resolve. So let's continue. And now this will actually move us into the override state where we will actually get into the container and actually be able to engage with it. Installs those tools for us that we can debug with. Now, one notice, this is a brand new feature. So as you use it, if you run into anything, please let us know. Uh, mention it in the, in the community, uh, just community.codefresh.io. If you run into any issues where, uh, uh, while this is in production, it is uh, definitely in active development as well. So I'm going to do my APK update and add Redis. There we go. I remember my command. Now let's try to run this, this list push. And you'll see that we actually get a success return. Why? Because the service is available to the step. It's not available before or after the step. Now, um, if we look at this, we've got our override set, and then we're going to move over to an override at the last step. So let's continue this on. And this is going to run the second step, which I think is just an echo or something. And now we're getting into this third step here. And once again, because we're overriding it, the uh, Redis is not installed. Um, so I, I should, uh, I think for this demo pipeline, I would actually replace it with an image that has the Redis CLI installed on it. Because um, there's no reason to just install the same tooling every time. You may as well just use a prepackaged image that's good to go. But uh, that's okay. No worries. So I'm going to go ahead and do my APK update and Redis. This does work with Debian, right? So I would be using AppKit instead if I were using a Debian-based image here. Um, and then I can use my Redis CLI command to read out my list, which uh, I actually can't remember off the top of my head, so I'm going to copy and paste it. There we go. We can see that we were able to push a list, we went two steps later, we were able to pull a list. So this actually shows you that the service is running persistently throughout the entire um, pipeline. So you can see how running services engage. And um, I think that this is like, this whole debug feature is really, really valuable when it comes to both debugging and building pipelines. And I have found that I have already saved an incredible amount of time by using this. And there's literally nothing else that out there like this. The only potential alternative is basically SSH in onto a node, which doesn't give you any of this information. And it doesn't allow you to step through a pipeline one step at a time and engage with it, examine what's going on, read out the variables and continue on. So um, just incredibly useful uh, as, a, as a tool set. So we'll just let that finish up. All right, so <clears throat> now the keen eyed viewers that are listening to this are all thinking, well, this is neat, but I am terrified because what are the security implications of having a debug console where people can just drop in and interact with the pipeline in real time? And I'm glad you asked that because this is critical to get right. Um, it's one of the reasons that I think it's such a bad idea for people to have SSH open on build nodes is because the security implications are not good. Um, but with CodeFresh, we've actually thought, thought through a lot of these things and we built in some, some guardrails. So first off, um, you have the ability with role-based access controls to set permissions around these pipelines. So you can say things like, only this pipeline can be debugged by this team. Um, so this means you can actually restrict it, right? Uh, also, these debug steps are subject to audit logs, and so you'll be able to see every time somebody actually runs the debug mode. Um, so you do have that audit trail ability. Um, the access controls also apply to clusters uh, as well as repositories and things like that. One of the things that you that is a feature that's coming out soon, it actually hasn't been released yet, is the ability to set debug permissions around resources. 
So for those that know how CodeFresh works, if I go over and open up like my Kubernetes dashboard, I have these Kubernetes clusters available as an object. So when I go to do a deploy, like I'll just show you a, a simple deploy step. Um, when I go to deploy, I actually just specify the name of the cluster that I want to deploy to and the, the permissions and the handshake is all handled by CodeFresh in the back end. So it's an object that's available, right? So what we're doing um, is we're actually going to set permissions around those objects to say things like, this is a production cluster and it can never be accessed for, from debug mode. Uh, that way there's no possibility someone could use debug mode to potentially push something uh, that they shouldn't, right? So um, we've actually kind of thought through the permissions of the debug platform uh, and had it reviewed by a number of different people to make sure that we um, are providing a very secure and robust experience. It's gonna work for everybody. Uh, uh, there are some limitations to be aware of. Um, if you are on, when you just sign up for a CodeFresh account, for the first 15 days, you get pro free. And then after 15 days, it reverts to basic. Now basic doesn't have access to do breakpoints in the pipeline. Um, uh, we also have some legacy plans that are not grandfathered into pro. So if you're on a legacy plan and you don't have access, uh, if you're on like a legacy pro plan or something or a custom plan and you don't have access to debugger, um, you'll actually need to move into one of our newer plans to have access to it. In the pro, you can add breakpoints to any step, you get the debug window, you can pause and resume, um, but you are limited to standard commands only. So you can't install custom tooling like uh, some of the things that I showed you where, where we actually installed custom tooling. Those actually aren't, those commands aren't available. Um, if you are on an enterprise plan, then you do get the ability to install tools dynamically um, and essentially full reign over the commands that you can run. Um, and uh, you also get auto completion, and then you also have the access to the role-based access controls. Role-based access controls are an enterprise feature already today, so there is a uh, there is that um, restriction on these things. Uh, the standard commands, I mean, even on the pro plan, the debug the debug window is still really really valuable because you can still examine your variables, your state, um, you can still run all those standard commands, so it's still really valuable. Um, but the enterprise allows you to get uh, a lot more funky with it. Um, and this is, this is mostly, um, you know, because of, uh, be, because we want to make um, something available to people, the teams that need the tools. And so we want to have an option for the pro plan that was available. Uh, so to summarize, this is the world's first CI CD debugger. There's literally no other platform. No one's ever done it. It blows my mind that debugging has been around, like the idea of breakpoints are not new, right? Like it's like a 20, 30 year old idea. Literally no one's ever put it into a CICD platform before. Uh, I think because one, they weren't container based, so it was really difficult to add breakpoints, but two, because uh, of the security implications and, and how to resolve those. So we've actually thought through both of those uh, parts, right? We have a container based pipeline, which is, allows us to do this incredible thing. Um, and also we have thought through the security implications to make sure that you can use this in a secure way and that your security team is going to pass off on it. So, um, you can stop resume pipelines, you can inspect files, variable services, install the tools on demand, lock down debugging controls. Great. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Costas who did uh, a lot of work on this presentation. He put together most of the slides. Um, uh, oftentimes I put together the slides and he, he, he'll build the demo this time. He built the slides and I built the demo, uh, but he's a part of the team that's, that's obviously uh, important for the content here. And you can read all this content on codefresh.io slash blog. Um, also shout out to Taryn for running these events and now we'll take questions. So you can get access to all this stuff, uh, at codefresh.io. You can try it out free. Um, if you have lapsed on your trial and you want to try this stuff out, feel free to contact us, open up a chat window and ping us to see if you can uh, get access to it if you qualify. Um, and uh, one other thing while you're, while you're putting in um, questions, I just want to give a quick shout out to DevOps Sember, which is going on right now. This is a month long distributed hackathon. That's our second year doing it. 
Uh, basically, you contribute to the DevOps of open source projects and you earn cool swag. This could be creating a pipeline, fixing a bug. Um, it doesn't have to be using Codefresh either. You can do it with whatever platform. Uh, go check that out. And uh, basically, you have to make three changes. It's very easy to do, uh, and you can earn some cool swag. So with that, let's take questions. Um, any questions? All right. Thanks so much, Dan. So I know you went over security a little bit, but I didn't hear if you um, specifically spoke about how secrets were protected during debugging. Ah, OK. So uh, it depends on how you're using the secrets, right? So if you're using something like, um, let's say, <clears throat> if you're using CodeFresh secrets built in, um, you'll notice that I actually um, I actually have access to uh, to a few secrets that were marked as encrypted with the pipeline when I was running in debug mode. Um, so this is a, this is one thing to be aware of that um, if your pipeline has access to a secret and you run it in debug mode, then by default you will have access during debug mode to that secret. Now, if you're doing something like Vault uh, and you're using the Vault step in order to bring in secrets then uh, you can't override that step to just go access arbitrary secrets. You can only get the secrets that have been specified from that step to be passed into the pipeline. Um, and uh, so uh, that is one component of it. And that's why I think the role-based access controls are, are important. Um, but another aspect of that is that like, when, when with CodeFresh, because something like a Kubernetes cluster is an object, um, you're actually only referencing it as an object. You're not necessarily uh, you're not necessarily getting um, secrets access from it. So uh, that is something to be aware of for sure is how secrets are exposed. One of the things we do recommend um, is actually having uh, dynamic secrets. So um, I don't, I'm trying to think if we have, the, we have this in a, we did a webinar on this like, I wanna say a year ago where uh, we actually generated dynamic secrets for like AWS that are dynamic to the pipeline. Um, so the secret could be leaked and uh, it's not a problem because it's been validated as soon as the pipeline is done running. So we actually do recommend doing something like that um, if you if you can. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that's something to be aware of. And I mentioned earlier that, um, that a feature we don't have yet that is coming is the ability to restrict access to resources. But I, and I think that'll also apply to secrets. So you can say things like, these encrypted secrets or this class of secrets or these shared secrets or this Kubernetes cluster, they're not available ever during debug mode. Um, so that way you have components that are available that you're aware of and components that uh, aren't um, because maybe they, they reach a different security level or something like that. So that's a great question. All right, and next question, and just a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A box if you have any. Um, when doing dev for a web app, can you interact with it in debug mode? When doing dev for a web app, can you interact with it? Uh, okay, so um, you could potentially, uh, okay, so, so one of the scenarios we didn't show today is um, I showed you services, but you can actually create uh, steps that run compositions, right? So you can have a step that actually executes your web app as a service in real time in the pipeline, and then you can actually use the debug console to uh, talk to that service or, or, or interact with it. Um, similarly, if we had a step with like Kube control installed or something like that, then we could actually um, we could actually talk to or apply configuration to a cluster, for example. So you could actually interact with the cluster in real time. Uh, now, something to mention with that again, is the permissions, right? So the role-based access control element on that that's that's coming out soon is is important. Um, and uh, but but you still can push and pull from a web app like that. And then any anything that can run in a terminal, you can you can essentially run. So if you have like um, you know you could have text-based browsers that you're using to interact with your application. I don't know. You could be running Selenium on those web services manually. Um, so you could try different things like that. Yeah, it's a good question. All right, thanks, Dan. And let's see, our next question is from our friend Rasmus. Was an option added so you could hit a post-phase breakpoint even if, some, uh, if something during the stage fails? Oh, yeah, okay. So um, there is a feature 
Uh, I don't know if it's generally available yet. I tested it um, a few days ago. Uh, that will, when a when a failure happens, it'll give you the option to do a debug on that step and interact with it. I don't think it's quite ready for prime time. Um, it seems to be uh, not quite there yet, but um, that is a feature that we're playing around with and uh, hopefully will be available soon. Cool, and our next question, can you integrate CodeFresh to security scanning tools like Static Scan, Fortify, or Dynamic Scan? Um, yeah. Oops, we when and I'm, I haven't heard of that one before and web inspect. Yeah, I, I haven't used those specific security scanning tools yet. You can see examples of like uh, white source, aqua, twist lock, um, Claire, that open source one. So there's no reason why you couldn't add those in as a step. All you need is uh, a container that knows how to execute it. Um, and for most of those tools, uh, it's, it's either just runs as a standalone like CLI command um, or there's a running service that it connects to and runs with like uh, in the case with Aqua. Um, and uh, if you haven't seen those, there's a great webinar that we did at codefresh.io slash events and just search Aqua and you can see uh, the interaction there because that one uh, actually will attach all the test results into the pipeline and onto the images um, as part of it. All right, thanks. And are there any concerns if the cluster has a surface mesh installed like Istio? Mm, no, uh, it, would, uh, it would be the same, same interaction surface that you would have uh, with any normal Kubernetes cluster. So I actually have a lot of, built a lot of services with Istio. Um, and that's another webinar shout out. If you haven't seen it, there's a great webinar on multi-cloud, multi-cluster, uh, Istio deployments with CodeFresh that is really cool. We actually do a canary release across several clusters that are part of the same service mesh. Um, so that's pretty rad to check out. But in terms of the debugger, zero impact, uh, would, there wouldn't be any impact on that. All right. And David wonders if we can get, a, get the example pipelines used in the presentation. And he's yes. a fantastic uh, feature, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, David. Uh, so yes, I actually, haven't dumped these into a Git repo yet. That's my bad. Uh, I will do that. They're very simple pipelines. They're they're basically all just you know Alpine images or whatever. But I will um, I will throw this into a Git repo and we will tweet it out. So follow uh, at CodeFresh on Twitter and also follow me at Today Was Awesome. And then I think Taryn, um, I'll get that done right after so that you can also put it in the follow up email that includes the presentation to everybody. Yes, perfect. All right. Well, that is all the questions we have for today. I do have one last comment from Logan, though. Great presentation. Amazing feature. Absolutely killer. Love it. And Dan, if you, ha you have um, the poll there, if you uh, were able to launch the um, feedback poll, we really appreciate your feedback um, that helps us improve um, our webinars. And so with that, Dan, any final words? No, I guess we should have started the poll while we we're answering questions, but uh, thanks yes. everyone for coming. <laughs> I think I've had just an enormous amount of fun playing with this feature and um, I was trying to break it when I started doing like the uh, <laughs> catting out dev, null, dev zeros to, to see what would happen. And I was, uh, I was frankly a little disappointed to find that it all worked as, as it expected. I was hoping I was gonna find some, some flaw or vulnerability or something, but uh, uh, it's worked pretty well. So um, I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> um, and then, Again, shout out for DevOps Sember. Uh, it's ongoing right now, and we are on the 11th, so only 20 days left to get your get your uh, changes, get your get your stuff put in. So thanks everybody, and I'm signing off. Have a good one. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye bye.